This is a very special family heirloom sent to me by a viewer to be restored in honor of his late father, the conductor Ray E. Hughes of the Texas and Pacific Railway. Ray carried this watch with him every single day he went to work. It may look bad, but what we really have here is a diamond in the rough. Under the hood is the iconic Waltham Vanguard, a 23 jewel railroad grade movement originally adjusted to five positions. As I restore any watch, I try to listen closely to the stories it can tell, where it's been, and how it may have served the person who carried it. Ray left high school after the 10th grade and eventually joined the US Navy in June 1940. He enlisted for six years in aviation maintenance hydraulics and served aboard the USS Saratoga CV-3. Soon after the war, in June 1946, he followed in the footsteps of his father and grandfather and joined the Texas and Pacific Railway, and worked as a conductor there until his retirement in 1986. Ray's wife had a checklist to help him prepare each time he left for work. Do you have your watch? Do you have the switch key? Do you have your lantern? Did you pack your slicker in case it rains? Did you pack the trip bag for clothes? Do you have cash in your wallet? In that order, so you can see where the watch stood in terms of priority. The crown had come off the watch, but it appears that the stem is still in the neck of the case. The stem is sheared at the threads. This can happen when using excessive force when winding an overwound movement. Removing the dust ring exposes the dial foot screws. Loosening these a bit allows me to carefully lift the dial away from the front of the movement. Denture cleaner tabs are a safe and effective way to clean up enameled dials such as this one. This is interesting. Not one, not two, but three dial washers are apparently needed here. I suppose the hour wheel was replaced at some point and maybe it was thinner than the original. I'll now remove the minute wheel and I'll use the presto puller to uninstall the cannon pinion. This balance is toast. I can tell the pivots are broken just by the way the wheel flops around like this. The balance wheel is secured to the balance cock by way of the hairspring. The stud screw is loosened so that the hairspring stud can be released. I'm trying to use brass tweezers when handling the decorated parts to reduce the risk of scratching them. As you can see here, both the upper and the lower balance pivots are gone. Not only that, the safety table of this double roller has a big crack. The balance jewels consists of a hole jewel and a cap jewel. They're removed from their respective plates now for inspection and cleaning. The capstone has a beautiful faceted design to it, which I don't see on more common movements. The hole jewel appears to be chipped around its hole. The trauma was likely sustained by the same impact that broke the balance pivots. I'm using a spare crown and stem to let down the power of the main spring. The click is held back while I control the unwinding of the spring with the crown. With the power let down, I can proceed with disassembling the train.
First, I remove the pallet bridge and pallet fork. It's good practice to inspect every part as it's uninstalled to get an idea of any repairs needed. Inspection also must happen again after cleaning, since all this debris could very well hide some damage. The pallet jewel is capped as well, which is common to find on these railroad grade movements. Looks fine, but you can see how debris made its way in between the jewels. This is why it's critical that these settings are separated for cleaning. The train wheel bridge is now removed, but I take my time to admire the beautiful design and amazing craftsmanship as I dive deeper into this movement. The ratchet wheel and crown wheel are removed. The crown wheel core was a little stuck due to the old oils. That will clean right up though. The click is removed and then the barrel bridge is lifted away. I'm now removing the center wheel, also known as the second wheel, the third wheel, the fourth wheel, and the escape wheel. Here I'm continuing to inspect all the parts, including each tooth of the escape wheel. The mainspring barrel is lifted away. The winding pinion and sliding clutch are removed. Here I'm removing this guard plate to reveal part of the keyless work. Unlike most watch movements, the yoke and yoke spring are on the train side of the main plate. Next, the intermediate setting gear is released from the plate and set aside. The setting lever is now uninstalled. The winding pinion is separated from the internal stem. The lower balance, escape, and pallet jewels are all capped. As with any capped jewels, they're all separated for cleaning. This way, the fluid has a better chance of reaching all the surfaces of the jewels. Don't let the magic of editing fool you. I am taking great care to keep track of which jewels went where, as the holes are of different sizes as designed for their respective pivots. The upper escape wheel capped jewel settings are also separated for cleaning. The movement features a jeweled mainspring barrel with two jewels which turn on a two-part barrel arbor. The barrel arbor parts screw together. The upper part of the arbor, the female part, accepts the ratchet wheel. The other part has a flange and a square that secures the steel barrel solidly together and threads into the female part. The two parts can be unscrewed by temporarily reinstalling the ratchet wheel for a better grip, or a pin vise could be used. Fortunately, the jewels do appear to be in excellent condition despite being quite dirty. The mainspring can now be unwound from the barrel. This is an old carbon steel mainspring, which is at the end of its useful life. It will be replaced with a modern alloy steel mainspring. 
the pre-cleaning ritual does make a huge difference in the outcome. Some debris or old oils have hardened to the surfaces of the parts over the years, like on the inside walls of the jewel holes. While modern cleaning solutions are quite good, they aren't really designed for this type of situation, so I need to spend some time manually pegging all the jewel holes and removing as much debris as possible before the parts enter the cleaning machine. Besides, cleaning fluid isn't cheap, and since it should be reused for at least a few watches, I'd hate to contaminate it with all this grime if I can help it. On to that broken balance. First, the hairspring collet is levered off of the staff. This balance features a double safety roller, which means I got to use my trusty Rex Roller Remover Tool. These angry beaver teeth do a fine job at securing the balance at the hub, while the staff is punched free of the roller, which comes off in two parts. The safety table is cracked and will ultimately need to be replaced. Unlike most staffs you've seen me replace, this one is friction fit into the balance wheel. And unlike on riveted staffs, the hub is actually part of the balance arm and the balance staff is simply held in by friction alone. This small hold punch will sit on the conical shoulder where the pivot was so that the staff can be tapped out of the hub. Since I'm not fighting the strength of a rivet, there's no concern here about inadvertently deforming the arms of the wheel. As you can see, the hub is riveted to the arms of the balance wheel and isn't intended to be removed. The replacement staff arrived and, after verifying all the dimensions were correct, I can proceed with the installation. This time, I'm using a slightly different punch so that it could fit over the lower part of the staff. It's then gently tapped until flush with the bottom of the hub. Shout out to David Moss, a watchmaker in Oregon, who I recently made a connection with. He helped me find a compatible donor movement to extract this new safety table. The challenge was, not all 1908 and 1899 models used double rollers, and I could not tell based on the serial number. So, he saved me a lot of trial and error in searching for a replacement. The roller tables are reinstalled in the same orientation as before. I did perform a quick static poise check and no additional adjustments were needed, so I'll see how the dynamics look later on when this thing goes on the time grapher. Thank you. 
The replacement alloy mainspring has a hole in its tail that links with this tab and secures it against the wall of the barrel. I ensure the tail is lined up with this tab while the spring is pressed into the barrel. A little bit of Mobius D5 lubricates the bottom of the barrel. D5 also lubricates the spring itself. The other half of the barrel has the arbor jewels and the mainspring hub. This is a slow moving point, so I'm going to use D5 for lubrication. The two halves of the barrel are fitted together and then secured using the two part arbor. Once again, I'm using the ratchet wheel to help screw the two halves of the arbor together. Each of the jewel settings removed earlier are now reinstalled into the main plate. These include the jewels for the escape wheel, pallet fork, and the balance. As you can see, I upgraded my screwdrivers partway through this restoration. And while they feel great, I can't really say anything too negative about the ones from Amazon I've used for the past couple years. The balance and escape jewels are lubricated using the version 1A automatic oiler with Mobius 9010. Standard practice dictates there really isn't any functional benefit to lubricating the pallet arbor jewels, possibly due to the limited rotation of the fork. One could lubricate them, but if anything it may sacrifice a bit of amplitude. The upper escape wheel setting is reinstalled as well, and also lubricated with Mobius 9010. This is the new upper balance hole jewel. Recall the original one was chipped around the hole. And the upper jewel setting with its gorgeous faceted endstone is fitted on top of it. As with the others, Mobius 9010 is injected through the hole jewel using the automatic oiler. Mollycoat DX grease is used to lubricate the internal stem, ratcheting faces of the winding pinion and the sliding clutch. The intermediate setting gear is fitted to the plate. The setting lever is now installed. A bit of DX grease is used on the hard metal on metal sliding surfaces.
The internal stem assembly is lowered into place before I've prepared to install the yoke. The yoke spring is actually backwards here. Towards the end, I will have realized this and turned it back around. Otherwise, the setting mode won't enter properly. Upon reinspecting all the clean parts, I observed some scoring on both the upper and lower escape wheel pivots. To maximize the performance this movement can yield, it's the little things like this that really need to be addressed. As you've seen me do in past videos, I'll use the jacket tool for this very purpose. The tool is like a small bow-driven lathe with a female center in the headstock and a flat runner in the tailstock. For the Steiner tools, the size of the runner is chosen to correspond with the size of the hole in which the pivot will turn, so I'm using the size 12 runner since I'm working with a size 11 pivot. The Bergen 2933G burnisher is what will be used to smooth over any imperfections and scoring in the pivot, while at the same time work hardening its surface. The burnisher is an extremely fine file with three sharp edges and one rounded edge, the latter of which is used for pivots that have a conical shoulder like on this escape wheel arbor. I'm gradually working the pivot with the burnisher in one hand while operating the bow with the other hand in opposing motions. The wheel is then turned around so the process can be repeated for the other pivot. The surface of the pivots here have been restored and the scoring has been eliminated. D5 lubricates the bushing where the mainspring arbor turns before the barrel is lowered into place. The escape wheel, the fourth wheel, the third wheel, and the second wheel are installed. I believe the center wheel in these movements have some gold content, though I'm not sure if it's just gold filled or solid gold. In any case, it's not your typical brass wheel. The barrel bridge is now installed. The train wheel bridge is lowered into place. I'll now carefully seat each of the pivots before thinking about tightening the plate. Even so, the screws aren't fully tightened until the very end. One final check for freedom in the train before fully tightening the screws. D5 lubricates the top arbor of the mainspring barrel where it would turn in the barrel bridge. I've been told that lubricating the click post isn't necessary and doing so just creates another place where dirt could accumulate, so I'm just going to place as small of an amount as possible.
The crown wheel is now installed and its sliding surfaces are lightly lubricated with D5 as well. The ratchet wheel is now fitted with the barrel arbor. Prior to installing the pallet fork, I'll now test fit the balance to check for freedom of movement and shake and impulse pin alignment. Doing this now helps immediately identify any issues in this area, which makes it easier to troubleshoot versus when the movement is running. Normally I would do this before installing the train, but it took a couple of weeks for the new balance staff to arrive, so I decided to make further progress on the rest of the assembly in the meantime. The hairspring stud is moved into position before it is then secured by tightening the stud screw. I visually ensure the hairspring is properly routed between the regulator pins. Each of the pallet stones is greased with Mobius 941. And now the pallet fork can be installed onto the plate and secure it with its bridge. As with other pivots, I ensure they're seated before fully tightening the screws. All train wheel pivots are lubricated with 9010. The cannon pinion is now installed. Another shout out to a kind viewer named Randy who sent me a complete set of bench keys. So now I can retire my eclectic collection of stems. These are so much easier to use. Thanks, Randy. I'm now carefully lowering the balance back into place. Will there be life? Ah, there is. I get such a good feeling seeing that and hearing that, especially knowing how much time could have passed since this watch had last run. Twenty-four hours has elapsed, which allowed the oils to run themselves in. So, after some regulation, I'm now verifying the five adjusted positions of dial up and down, pendant up, right, and left. I'll put the movement aside now and deal with the case situation. With agreement from the owner, I'm going to give it a light buff to shine it up. Nothing too crazy, as it is gold after all. It also means the scratches and other imperfections will remain, but that can be considered part of the history of this timepiece. Even the crown gets a little love too. There's still the situation with the broken stem. Those who have dealt with this know that stems are very specific to the case. I could just buy piles of stems from eBay in the hopes of finding one that works, but I found that to be a crapshoot. Instead, I actually find it quicker to just make a new one to the precise specifications. There is the benefit of having part of the existing stem to use for reference. I'm still not an expert in lathe work, but I will say that making stems is a great way to learn how to turn using the hand graver, especially if you're just starting out. I start with a steel rod that's close to the target width. I then turn it down to size in sections. 
Having the original for reference is helpful, but if not, I would need to incrementally test fit the part in the case and the movement, which isn't impossible, but it just takes longer. I just turn the stock down one segment at a time. The only section I really have to take an educated guess on is the threaded part. I simply find a size that works for the crown and turn the section to be the right width, but longer than needed. From there, I can always shorten it if needed. Here, I'm holding the tailstock against the thread plate to ensure it's square against the work. I'm filing each side of the winding square using the index of the headstock as a guide. There are 90 degree reference points. I'm trying my best to keep my hand consistent between each side despite owning a single roller file rest. Not perfect, but it's a pretty close match. Now, I know I didn't really need to turn the setting detent into the stem because this is a lever set movement after all, but I really wanted to recreate the stem as it originally was. After all, the case itself was designed to support both lever set and pendant set movements. Now to toughen it up with some heat treating to a blue color. Since it's rare to see such a vibrant blue on a winding stem, I'll soak it in vinegar for a short while to eliminate some of that color. Now this is close to the color one would find on an antique stem. The stem and crown are now fitted with the case. Winding and setting mode both work, but I know that setting mode won't be ever used for this movement. The bezel will receive a nice brand new glass crystal with a beautiful sharp beveled edge. White manufacturing makes some excellent crystals to the exact specifications, and I've used them for all my recent restorations. I found new old stock crystals to just be inconsistent in shape and quality. Now a little before and after comparison. The minute wheel is installed with a slight bit of D5 on its post. The hour wheel is lowered on top of the cannon pinion. I'm placing a single dial washer, rather than all three, because I'm curious whether they're all needed. The foot screws are now tightened to secure the dial before the dust ring is then fitted around the movement. Guys, if you're enjoying this video, please let me know if you stuck with me this far. I appreciate all the encouraging feedback you leave me in the comments. Don't forget to hit the like button as well, but only if you feel I've earned it. Your support truly motivates me to make more of these. With the hour hand installed, I can test and observe that the hour wheel does unfortunately disengage with the minute wheel under the dial. So I'll need to backtrack and place those extra couple of dial washers like it originally had. Doing so will prevent any inadvertent shifting around of the hour wheel.
It was an honor to be trusted with the task of breathing new life into this treasured family heirloom that is not only functional again, but can revive warm memories of a beloved father. I hope it stands as a testament to preservation and the timeless connection that binds us to our roots. But I also hope that you all learned something from this video today, and if not, I hope you at least found it enjoyable. Thanks for fixing watches with me today, and I'll see you in the next one.